It's Comics Are Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live out of the Ann Arbor District Library Netcast Studio in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan, right in the corner of 5th and William. And this is the show about comics, comics lifestyle, how to make comics, how to write comics, how to think about comics, so all the different stuff that surrounds this medium that we love so much. And, oh, is this for comics creators then? Well, no, because we talk about a whole lot of things that I think would be of interest to anybody who just enjoys comics or is curious about comics, like... You know, if you uh, are curious about wine and you want to know what's the difference between a Merlot and a Cabernet, uh, this is the show where we then talk about... Please call in and <laughs> let us know. <laughs> but I, we've got a big, big round table today. This uh, is amazing. <laughs> this is going to be a fun show because, okay, I'm going to go through the introductions real quick. We've got Paul Story, who has returned. Hey, I'm back. Paul Story, uh, the the smaller Paul Story, the, the, the reduced, the, the, yes. redu- the re- reducing, as they yes. used to say, yeah. the reduced Paul Story of Storyville dot com has returned to be our in studio guest. Good to see you again, Paul. Good to see you again, Jersey. And then, and oh, I actually mean that. Oh wow! It, well, I, I, that's nice to hear. So then we've got. Uh, speaking of good to see, uh, one of the best looking guys in comics, Brandon Dayton, is on the Skype. Brandon Dayton of Brandon dot com. Hey, good to be here. And then uh, last minute addition, man, I got to uh, extend my heartfelt gratitude to Dave Roman of yaytime.com, uh, who showed up at the last minute, just woke up. He's eating his steel cut oats as he uh, quickly gra- wraps up his <laughs> breakfast to talk about comics with us. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I never take time to uh, express my gratitude also to the Ann Arbor District Library for putting on this show. You know, it's been a little over a year since we started recording out of the AADL Netcast studio. And uh, Matt Dubay, Matt, are you there? Are you on the mic? I think so. Okay, I hope you make it into the recording. Matt Dubay works so hard to put this show together. Really and does. and uh, when I first approached the library about doing the show, I said, hey, it should be live. It should be live streamed. And we should even be able, be able to have people call in on Skype. And they didn't have any of that stuff set up yet. Matt set all this stuff up. And not and before anybody goes like, oh, well, Jersey, what kind of uh, poll do you have? It wasn't just for me. Because you guys do a lot of different shows out of the Ann Arbor District Library Netcast Studio, don't you, Matt? Well, we're working on... A- couple we've got three in the works one's a a maker podcast called tinker hub the other one is uh, a, sh- a show about scents that we're working on uh i'm not sure if you're familiar with glass pedal smoke but it's a, a popular blog that that delves into scents and then we're working on that show S- scents as, as in, in smell aromas S- 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 yes. thank you and it's then a podcast about smells it's it's yeah. an interesting concept it's going to be fun to see how that comes together <laughs> And then we've got uh, one more. It's called Talking to My Generation. It's uh, some great kids from the Gen X and Gen Y generation talking to other generations about, I don't know, different topics and how the generations differ on their views. And, and how the Who was before their time. Uh, well, some of the people on the show will, will probably not know about the Who, but others may. But So the point is that you guys are producing more shows than just this now, and then you can find them at AADL.org. But... Uh, but you know what's what's interesting, and this is the thing I want to throw at the top. You know, is that uh, these guys are quickly becoming what I think is the 21st century model for PBS. And as we all know, when President Romney is in charge in a few months, and it will happen, everybody. Not that you know, uh, I'm not making wow, any political. You are a ray, a ray of sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> but when he's in charge and he gets rid of PBS, thank goodness we've got AEDL.org to put yeah. on more. Sh- now, yeah. anybody that don't once, read into that statement. Once, once Big Bird's been de- killed, Matt <laughs> will be taking his place. Yeah, but no, in, in actual. Actually, I, I want to make it clear that I don't have any particular p- political leanings. And one of the fun fun things that I like to do with people is say, "What, what do you What do you think I am?" Uh, as far as like uh, left or right, pick your, or or pick whatever they don't like and and wind them up. <laughs> Sometimes, <laughs> yeah. But but you know, the funny thing that I get is like from my my left wing friends are like, "Well, you seem like a well well adjusted guy, so you've got to be a Democrat." And then my right wing friends say, "Well, you seem like a well adjusted guy, so you've got to be a Republican." <laughs> and I don't I don't like to answer that question either way. I was just making and a little. I'm joke more point. like you're not very well adjusted at all. <laughs> Actually, my so, question is, how is Anne making you vote? <laughs> <laughs> Now we thought about canceling each other's votes out, a la Archie Bunker. But no, that's that's another discussion for another time. Because this week we've got to talk about backstory. That we're gonna dive right into the topic. Then we'll talk a little bit more about what you guys actually do to establish your credibility. First, let's uh, you know <laughs> let you let your your words speak louder than your actions as we uh, dive into this. Brandon, you pitched this topic, so let's hear from you. Why 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 backstory? Why is this topic interesting to you? 
Well, most uh, topics that become interesting to me are because I'm, uh, you know, trying to understand them. So, you know, I come into the discussion with a lot of ill-formed thoughts as usual and trying to kind of make sense of them. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was just doing some writing and I, I kind of was finding this this conflict I was having between, I guess, using backstory as, as kind of a, as a climactic tool versus using using backstory as, as getting information that you need to move the story along. So I just, it started making me wonder a lot about, you know, backstory and, and how to use it and its purposes and whatnot. So both from a theoretical standpoint and then a practical standpoint of yes. uh, like how to actually put it into use, uh, you know, maybe, maybe it'd be a good idea to throw out the mischaracterizations of backstory first and then see if we can, just, go ahead, Paul. Well, I was going to say, it's interesting though, because there are basically two distinct uses for the term backstory in that there are some, some people, and, and Brandon seems to be focused on this side, um, or, or this, you know, this side of the coin, how it's at, uh, which is the backstory that plays into the story, that actually comes out, um, you know, the story, uh, you know, backstory is what happens before your story starts, and some people use it to refer to what they bring in in flashbacks, in exposition, um, you know, in, in dialogue, uh, talking about what happened previously. But I also think of backstory as just the history of the characters of the setting of the thing that doesn't, n and, and not all of that's necessarily going to make it onto the page. So we're actually dealing with two, two aspects. Um, we have to decide how much of that uh, backstory actually makes it into the story. Yeah, and I, I think when we were discussing it earlier, the the way we were kind of talking about it is there's backstory as it relates to the story, and then kind of as Paul's saying, this kind of this um, I guess uh, world building aspect of backstory where you kind of flesh out the world so you understand the world, but um, that may not be necessary to to your story that you're telling it may not actually help the story, but it helps you understand the world, I guess. <clears throat> yeah, that's how I was trying to wrestle with this one, too, is I was cobbling together some rough notes for this, and I was trying to figure out, uh, you know, there's the old idea, the, the, the old notion of you have to build a complete and solid world. I, I brought an example. Uh, here's, oh, here's, here's a 10-year-old notebook. I've got, I've got <laughs> this is volume one of pages and pages. Do you want me to just... Of, uh, Oh, well, I, we can. I can just oh, do it this wow. way. That's fine. I don't want. It's not necessarily that anybody reads it, but like doing, you know, study designs of spaceship. This was for like my big space opera thing that it was gonna uh, eight volumes, a thousand pages. Oh, <laughs> maps, maps, everybody! Look at this. And I've got all the different cultures mapped out. I had alphabets designed, and I had languages and different races. And there's several notebooks just filled with notes about the backstory of this world and. Uh, you know, I thought, well, that's what you got to do. You have to complete, uh, create a. What did you want to look at it, Paul? No, no, <laughs> you kept eyeballing I, no, it. No, it just looked like you were gonna, you know, like end up reaching back and then just uh, oh, dropping just dropping it. it. No, but um, but yeah, I thought you had to do that, and I realized that I was writing so much stuff that I wasn't actually writing anything about the characters in the story. I was writing about the world that they were gonna live in, and I I broke it down. I broke down, and let's see what I'll pitch this to you guys and see if you guys what you guys say about this. I thought. I was trying to figure out, okay, what's the function of this thing? What is what is what purpose does backstory serve based on or leaping off of what you just said about whether it's to support the narrative or whether it's the world in which the characters live? And I thought, well, there's historical backstory, world buildy stuff, and this is the Lord of the Rings movies front end, where they spend like three minutes going, This is the world, this is the ring, the seven rings for the elves and whatever, or dwarves. And then there's motivational character backstory, and this is like the intro scene to the Incredibles where they're setting up that this was once the world that, that these characters lived in, and then it changed, and now we're getting to the story, where it's about the guy trying to get his old life back. Batman, here's his parents, they're dead, now he's Batman, the end. Which is interesting, because, of course, that was that was add-on backstory. That was never the, you know, that was not the original. There was no oh, backstory. Oh, the, the 1938 yeah. Batman? Yeah. yeah, it started out, and somewhere, you know, a few issues in, they went, uh, well, we should probably explain something. Huh. So they made, you know, 
they came up with that with that powerful powerful story that to this day people still talk about and then then there's revelatory or plotty backstory and this is harry potter where wait harry don't do the thing until i tell you about this historical thing that i didn't tell you about in chapter two but now it's chapter eight so it's time for me to tell you or v for vendetta where we slowly find out more and more about the history of v uh, to understand more of what the ramifications and stakes are of the plot uh, did I miss anything, or did, or is this a mischaracterization of the of three different types of backstory, Dave? No, that was good. <laughs> I just get right down. Yeah. Uh, now Dave's setting you on. Uh, Dave's setting you up with a false sense of security. I know. <laughs> before he pounces later. Shut it down. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so, but I mean, like, I think the the looking for a useful way to talk about this thing beyond like you know diagrammatic professorial kind of classroom mm-hmm. stuff. Uh, how do we know when we've crossed the line between being the dungeon master who's constructed what? all these maps and worlds? I I would argue actually that that it, I find it funny that you you do that be, uh, you you specify like the dungeon master who's like laying out too much stuff, whereas most dungeon mastering is actually done to echo the sandbox world building that Tolkien did. Um, so it, it in other words. You're kind of like saying, "Oh, when are we? You know, are we taking too much from from RPGs?" But I think RPGs took it straight out of um, the the idea that Tolkien, you know, started out with his languages and his histories. Sure, um, sure. Uh, so, uh, but uh, yeah, that's that's it, the the interesting part is how much do you need to know to tell, or you know, the important thing is how much do you need to know to tell the story you want to tell. Um. And if you don't, you know, if you don't need to know um, what uh, King Kamehameha, uh, <laughs> you know, ate for lunch, uh, you know, in the 13th century, okay. then, then don't do it. But so, you're speaking as somebody who's had his share of writing projects. You know that. You have a gut feeling about it through doing it over and over and over again, right? But I'm saying to the young person who comes to me with like, I've got this eight volume epic like I did in that yep. notebook, right? And like, how do how do they know? What are the, the warning signs to look out for to know that you've, you're spending too much time working on worlds and not enough time working on... What's the, what I'm trying to get at is what's the difference between story and backstory? Can we define that? Yeah, you know, I was trying to think about this um, over the last couple of days and... and one th- question I was trying to figure out is what's the difference between backstory and, and just nonlinearity, you know? There's a lot of stories that, that may jump around in, in, a, in a different linear sequence like Memento or, <clears throat> you know, that's just, you know, one I can think of. And some of those, it's the, the whole story is just chock full of flashbacks and flash forwards and flashes to the side and stuff. And, <laughs> you know, I, I, I really wonder if structurally that's, that's any different. You know, maybe backstory, when we think of backstory, we kind of feel like it's in smaller amounts. But I wonder if it's really doing anything different than, than a larger, more complex, nonlinear story. Um, I don't know. Maybe that doesn't answer that question at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just, I want to throw in uh, another dynamic of this. Like we're talking mostly about from the writer's perspective, um, but there's also to sort of take in the audience perspective. Um, Paul was mentioning Batman and how originally there wasn't necessarily an origin story to that character, but eventually felt people felt they needed to add one, right? Um, whereas now you can't make a Batman movie without, going right to the origin story. Every time they do a superhero movie, they want everybody wants to tell the origin story. Nobody really trusts audience to just do a superhero movie that just sort of takes the character, um, you know, in the middle of a story. Everybody wants to be the one to tell that origin story. And, it, and I'm not sure if that's because the audience demands that or, I, you know. There's a do, certain lack of trust, I think, with, think in the audience. Trust. I think that they don't, they don't trust the audience to know something that may be e- even though it's part a part of the popular consciousness i don't think they necessarily trust the audience to uh. no uh, yeah i can see that because you're always there's always going to be someone in the audience that doesn't know spider-man's origin story or you know i was i was i mean when i when i first went and saw the spider-man movies i really didn't know all this history with uncle ben that was like totally new to me and i had read spider-man since like forever you know so well, I just think it's like interesting with the new Spider-Man movie, which is only a couple of years 
since the the previous some people enjoy seeing the retelling like oh you know oh yes there's the classic uncle ben story again yeah. And other people were like, ah, just get past the Uncle Ben stuff and get yeah. right to the meat, you know. Why are we watching this again? Yeah. 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 I, I wonder, though, if the I, – I kind of feel like in – structurally, though, the origin story is is kind of – I mean, it's kind of the why why should I care part of the story. And uh, I don't know. You had your, your three categories before uh, Jersey, right? Oh, historical, yeah. motivational, and revelatory. Yeah, so I think uh, you know the backstory is kind of historical and 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 motivational in some ways, and I think maybe one of the questions for for writers to ask is to be very clear about what type of story they're telling, and then kind of understanding what type of 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 backstory they're using. Um, one one story that I that a friend of mine kind of told me about that I thought was really interesting was about the development of Finding Nemo. When they were making Finding Nemo, they were having real problems with the story working, and originally. It was the whole story had these flashbacks to um, to Nemo's past or what, what's what's I can't remember Nemo's father's name, but kind of you know that whole story where the mother dies and everything. There used to be a series of flashbacks throughout the movie, and finally they decided, you know what, for us to care about what he's doing throughout this whole movie, we just need to know this right now. So they ended up just putting that all in the beginning, and I think at one point they wanted it to be revelatory, and they realized no, this isn't revelatory. This is like motivational we need to know this to even get the story story started you know mm-hmm. that's that to be sympathetic to that character because like taking that aspect out of it maybe he becomes annoying right because he's so yeah. paranoid and he's so you know he's a sort of high maintenance father um so you could just be like oh this guy this father you know what what's this guy's deal but i guess if you know that he's a survivor of you know this death of his wife uh, and those other kids it makes you sort of put up with him more. Well, yeah, yeah as yeah. as Rob Worley described that it's a home invasion, right? It starts out with a home invasion and a murder. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's some something going on uh, around online about like, oh, uh, like a fake text exchange about, oh, I just watched this thing about this guy whose wife is murdered and his son is kidnapped and he <laughs> and and he has to go and find him. It's like, oh, what is that? It's called Finding Nemo. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which is ironic too, because then in uh, what is it, John Carter, it's it's like he didn't learn the lesson because John Carter is basically flashbacks of why you should care about John Carter throughout the movie. When it's like, I don't know, you know, he, he it's the same story. It's his family getting murdered, but you get that in flashbacks throughout the movie instead of right at, at the beginning. So I thought that was kind of ironic, and I I didn't care. In the case of John Carter, I was like, I really don't, I don't see why this is even in here. So. Well, and 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 mostly it was added. That was yeah. that was not the the Princess of Mars story. Oh, so, really? Yeah. I I still haven't seen it. I I heard both good things and terrible things about I, it. I loved certain aspects of it, but yeah. a lot of the story stuff, you're just like, you know, get on with it. Uh, and yeah. that's that is that's a good, um, that's kind of a good indicator. You know, you were saying about well, you're talking about what what's too much prep, but mm-hmm. I think. Um, there's also a point where it's like, what is too much exposition and, uh, you know, expository backstory? Uh, once you like start the beginning of the Lord of the Rings films, right? Which, I, I mean, I, I, I would argue that that was necessary. Yeah. Uh, but, but in John Carter, what they ended up doing was telling you way too much about what happens before. You know, there's the old adage. Uh, I think it actually came from screen prep plays, but um, the old adage, come in late, get out early. Mm. try and, and just pare things down to what the audience absolutely needs um, instead of um, kind of he got up in the morning, he took a shower, yeah. he ate his steel-cut oats in front, of a, <laughs> in front of a live studio audience. Um, well, John Carter does something in addition to that too, though, because the movie actually opens with like a flash forward to what you're going to see later in the film, right? Like it doesn't, just start with John Carter and his normal life and how he ends up on Mars. They open the film with like a Mars battle sequence, uh, like a big action sequence as if to say like, 
sit through the next yeah. 20 minutes where he's like in the civil war and he's a prisoner and he's going to go through all the, because eventually we're going to see spaceships. And oh God. I am so guilty of that. Sort of, wait for it. Wait for it. Wait yeah. for it. Yeah. Uh, another animated film that I think of that does a lot of jumping around like that, at least initially is the emperor's new groove. Have you guys seen that? No, yeah, I like that movie. I, I love it. A while, but yeah, I, I, I thought it was really good. Uh, but, but it starts with a llama crying in the rain and then, uh, uh, you have David Spade's voice coming in saying, like, yeah, you see that llama? That used to be a king, and this is this is his story. And then he backs up to before he became a llama to get to the point halfway through the film where he's the llama in the rain again, right? Yeah. Although, but, you know, I, and again, there's where I start getting that weird twitchy feeling. It's like how much, once once you've incorporated it into your story, I feel weird calling it backstory. Well, okay, that's where yeah, I was trying yeah, to get that's at. That's what I was trying to get at here. So I think point. I think we're roundabout coming to the answer to that question is that Dave and Paul, you both said that you made an emphasis on caring. Well, and Brandon, you talked about Finding Nemo. You made an emphasis on ca- uh, getting the audience to care about the character, give a damn about what's going to happen to this character. Such and language. <laughs> I know, uh, but uh, so if if it's information that contributes to you caring about the character, then it's not really backstory; it's part of the story, right? I mean, right. the Captain it's America story movie. Story. Yep. Yeah. Well, that's um, the 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 TV series Lost is like a hundred percent all about that because it's constantly jumping back and forth between a present day scenario where the characters are doing things that are very despicable, and you're like, "What the hell is the deal with these characters?" <laughs> So they're constantly flashing back to sort of get you to be a little bit sympathetic, to sort of see that there's supposedly this underlying reason why these characters are acting so cryptically or so strangely or ways that you're like, why would you do that? And then they flash back and show you right. sort of oh, okay. you know, their past that, you know, and it's, it's constantly doing that. And then like, uh, Brendan said, like, eventually they flash forward and then they flash sideways and then they do, <laughs> yeah. they do all the flashes. I think one of the reasons that works with Lost, too, is because there is such a large cast of characters. You know, there's, there's, from the beginning, there's always someone that you care about. So they start with a compelling story and you have a lot of other side characters like Locke. Locke gets introduced while, while they're tearing, telling some other character's story. And initially, he's a very, you know, two dimensional character. He's just this kind of really mysterious guy you're not sure if he's good or evil and then you can tell his backstory later when kind of when it's time but you know if it was just a story about Locke, you'd be just be like i don't care why do i care about this guy you know but because they have all these other stories you care about then you're patient enough when you get to his story you know um so I thought that was interesting. But <laughs> I, I want to I want to drive at this in one more direction because we just we just got to motivational as far as like the function of backstory. But I want to get to world buildy stuff because there are such things as stories where it's about living in a world, right? When you talk about Tolkien again, I mean yep. he's a great example, one of the primary examples of uh, a book that is just as much about looking at the freaking bushes of Middle Earth as it is about following Frodo and Sam's struggles. Well, right? maybe not quite. Quite equal. But. Se- second book with with uh, no, Legolas, I, Gimli, and Aragorn running. There's like a whole chapter of describing the landscape I, as they're running. I do running. realize that, yeah, but <laughs> yeah. I, I I would argue it might not be quite equal importance. Okay, but but yeah. So I mean, they, 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 there's a case for this this world building stuff. Yeah. And uh, what are some good examples that people could look at of books where they do that kind of uh, world building? I you know what? I don't know why it popped to mind as I was uh, as I was driving out here. Howard Chaikin's American Flag. Really? Because it's, it's you know, it's a very different... It's started as our world, but lots of spin. It's a science fiction setting. And he had... He just gave... He didn't always, like, go, okay, this is what happened here, and this is what happened here. And, like, you know, for the character, he's like, oh, Ruben Flagg used to be a TV star, got replaced by digital technology, which, wow... You Prescient. Know? Yeah. And, um, you know, hey, uh, you know, things were going south and suddenly, like, consumerism took over everything. But he just, he doled it out. You know, like, he would introduce the concept of the Metroplex uh-huh. and then kind of dole out as throughout the story, like, what exactly that meant. You know, what it meant for the, the city to be a mall, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah, I... I, I Looking back on that, he did a really amazing job of of coming up with a, a world 
that, you know, with familiar aspects, but that had been changed dramatically, um, you know, through a series of events and then kind of doling out those events and and also the uh, the the various character histories where, you know, somebody would show up and it's like, oh, no, it's so and so. And mm-hmm. then you find out, you know, that these people have, you know, a, a history together. Um, so, I, yeah, I, it, it was one that just kind of jumped out at me. I just popped into my mind. I haven't read American Flag since I was a kid. I gotta, I gotta pick that up again. Like, well, kid, like thirteen. I was, I was gonna say you were reading American Flag. Well, <laughs> eight year old. <laughs> yeah, this no, um, this is kind of uh, reminds me of. I've heard uh, Orson Scott Card describe these type of stories as m- milieu stories, mm. and you know, if that's the type of story you're telling, then world building is absolutely what you need to do. And kind of the the trademark of these types of stories is someone taken from one world and put into another world. So like you guys just discussed Zeta the Space Girl, or I can think of something like Amulet or Wizard of Oz or even Lord of the Rings because Lord of the Rings is about hobbits in their safe world being that's very kind of very similar to our world being introduced to this other strange world. And in that case, discovering the world is very much a part of the story. And so I mean world building does make sense in in that case because you're, you know, New creatures, new customs. I mean, that's part of part of the drama is the fish out of water adjusting to how things are different in that world. So the the details of how the world works are, are very important. Right. And I think the issue is at what point, you know, do you go too far, right? Like you just you you're overthinking everything. Um, and it seems like the balance is getting to the point where you have enough information that people believe it and it's just making sure that there is i feel like anybody who reads a story like that just wants to make sure that there is an internal logic to the whole thing right like nobody wants to read a fantasy novel where it's clear that the author you know wasn't even consistent with their own world building rules or the way their magic system works or um what have you they just want to believe that you know this is this is this is all intentional and not haphazard um, which, you know, I always, I always like doing school visits, uh, in Jersey, I'm sure you've come across this, uh, you know, doing workshops with kids and stuff there, to me, there's always two different types of kids who approach story. There's the kid who has the binders and all the world building and they've got, you know, this generation of families related to this family and this guy used to be a prince, but now he's a ninja and, and you know, this planet exists, you know, in this crazy solar system. And then you have the other kid who's just making it all up as they go along. And they're just like, you know, what's, what's going to happen in panel two? I don't know. I'm just going to start drawing and see what happens. Um, <laughs> you know, usually those stories are a lot funnier. <laughs> yeah. I, and, and I think sometimes it's, uh, you know, it, it's, there's something to be said for, going ahead with the story and and then if you hit a point where you realize ooh i need to know something or the reader needs to know something you can go back and figure it out then mm-hmm. yeah. now you know and you can even if if you're worried about your page count or whatever for the day you can put in like mm, bit you know bit of history you know in parentheses <laughs> and then like after you're done with your page count for the day you go back and go like figure out that bit of history and then add it in later. I mean, there is something to be said for that. But I think part of you were saying, when do people know? Yeah. That, yeah. Part, partly it has to do with what Dave is saying. What kind of writer are you? Ah, uh, because that was my next question is, of those two kids, I wanted to ask Dave, yeah. which is the right kid? <laughs> 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 which one is Goofus? Which one is Gallant? That's what I want to know. Uh, <laughs> you know, my feeling personally is... I, I is, when I'm writing, I, I think a balance of those two things is really important. There's a time when you need to just like go with the flow and let all the crazy weird ideas come out. And then there's a time when you need to start locking it down and say, okay, let's, let's start making this make more sense, you know? And so, yeah, I think if you can mix both those things, I think that's, that's what's worked best for me, you know, is to try to go back and forth between those two things. Yeah. For me, that's where, that's where I really like collaborating in the writing process because I think that I tend to be very stream of conscious and, and have a lot of different ideas that can go in a lot of different directions and having someone to sort of bounce those ideas off of and sort of 
you know, sort of point me in that direction and be like, no, no, no this is better than this. And let's sort of focus it here. Um, because I think for me personally, you know, nothing feels permanent right away. Like all the ideas in my head really just feel like ideas and, and nothing feels permanent until I tell them to somebody else. And then they kind of sort of say, yeah, that's, that's working or that's not working. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you, whether you, that's an editor, or whether that's, you know, your wife or whether that's your co-writer or the artist on the book who, or uh, even just an art buddy to bounce off of. Yeah. Right. So you can see what they're responding to. Right. It's like testing out material in front of an audience kind of thing, rather than just working alone, not knowing if it's any good. And I think that's the hardest part. Uh, so can we come up with a definition uh, or some kind of distinction between the different uses of backstory here? Because I think that this is an Absolutely opportunity. Not. Oh, no. <laughs> Son of a gun. Because, like, what we're talking about is, like, yeah, like, so can backstory refer to uh, information within a story that supports the story but is historically uh, back in time from where the reader's eye is in the tale, whereas maybe we could call the other version well, like uh, the Bible, the yeah. World Bible. Uh, yeah, yeah. Or well, and it doesn't necessarily even have to be. It could be uh, what they they don't call it this, especially in comics because it's confusing. But uh, a lot of uh, writers used to do what they call character sketches, mm, which yeah. was the background of the character before. Yeah. Um, but I, I guess you know the interesting thing backstory is sort of everything that happens before you start your story. So, um, bef but, like, in the case of the, um, uh, the, 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 uh, the groove, uh, huh? uh, the, the one you were talking about, the llama. Emperor's New Groove. Oh, Emperor's, Emperor's New, New groove. groove, yeah. Sorry, I was just drawing a blank. <laughs> you know, I just, just call it the groove. The groove. The groove. <laughs> llama groove. <laughs> um, you know, you then you have to argue, like, does the story actually start where the story starts or does it start with like the earliest thing that, you know, kind of you see on screen or yeah. is, is that the work of a hack looking for a hook? Is that what you're saying? I don't know. <laughs> That's man. Maybe, I, I, maybe sometimes you have to decide like, Hey, does, is this backstory just need to be where the story begins, you know? Yeah. Rather than using some sort of artistic convention to go back to this, this time in the past, maybe just need to start it in the past and then, you know, continue on from there but and i hate to be that guy but then then no, it becomes the story it doesn't it that's when story. i yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's exactly. the weird that's I the weird that's part kind of the yeah when you... <laughs> it's like this this circle it's like this uh, you know we get this thing that recurses on itself or but whatever I, I, you know i i, I actually I, I either am ashamed or proud of doing this i actually kind of popped around to several writing websites just to see how they describe backstory and mostly it seemed like they were kind of indicating that it was the stuff that kind of cropped up more expositionally. Mm. Yeah. You know, like, uh, you know, if somebody, you know, said, oh, I, I you know, I, I'm so sorry your dad died. But you never really, you know, flash back to it. You don't, you know, it's sort of like things that are mentioned so that it's, might it's, be motivation It's or the whatever. David Michelinie scripts where Peter Parker's swinging across town going, boy, my life sure did change since I got bitten by that radioactive <laughs> spider. <You know? laughs> well, you know, that's... It's, that's it's from the Jim Shooter frame. days. Yeah, but yeah. that's a, that's a cer certain amount of it is yeah. that, you know, uh, a lot of people were defining it as the things that might be referred to but don't necessarily, you know, get... Um, like, they're, they're essential for knowing your character, knowing your setting, but they don't get delved into. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that, uh, you know, because, uh, and, yeah. and you were talking about when does backstory become story? I mean, look at, like, talk about Tolkien. The Silmarillion <laughs> was backstory. Yeah. But eventually it got released. Cause, uh, yeah. Um, although um, that was after his death, so it was sort of like, might have just been the estate yeah. and the publishers going, <laughs> you know, this will make what, us some, money. Some smells like money. Sell this. <laughs> yeah, you know this. This kind of reminds me a little bit. Maybe this is 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 a good example. I don't know. Maybe we can poke holes in this, but I, it makes me think about you know Jaws, where uh, I can't remember. Can I even remember it? Richard Richard Burton is that? Isn't no, it's not Richard Burton. Richard no, Dreyfus. <laughs> Richard Dreyfus. <laughs> no, no, not not him. The the old sailor dude. Oh, like, oh, that why can't would be Robert name? Shaw. Uh, yes, Robert the, Shaw. The inimitable, the awesome, the incredible. <laughs> I love when Robert he, Shaw. Robert Sorry. Shaw is, is amazing. Um, but Sorry. when he's telling the whole story about 
about um, being in the water with the sharks in World War II. You yeah. know, it doesn't really propel the story. You know, nor does it. Nor does it even tell you like, oh, he's this crusty old guy, but here's why. It's just this kind of interesting element to his character that that just like sets the tone in a really cool way. I was going to say, that's know? a tonal thing, isn't yeah. it? That's yeah. setting yeah. up like, well, this it, feeling it, of dread. It, it also, yeah, it adds to the whole, you know, it gives you a little bit about him, but it also gives you that whole, like, can you imagine <laughs> being in the water knowing the sharks are there? Or you know, every there, yeah. Fourth and, category. I just added it to the list for the show notes. Tonal or feeling, right? Yeah. And it, so. gives, it kind of adds a little bit of a sense of vulnerability to his character, too, I guess. But uh, yeah, Dave. Dave, do you di- agree or disagree with that? Um, for the notes, yeah, that sounds fine. I was just thinking <laughs> <Yeah>. that sometimes. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, fine. Whatever. Yeah, yeah, Whatever. Sure. I'll <laughs> allow like, it. I'm here for the conflict, and I'm just so agreeable. Yeah, there's uh, been not one actually. I know. <laughs> um, but I was thinking in some ways that it's sort of like um, parents. Like sometimes some characters. So like the flat you were talking about the revelatory. Um, like parents are like the ultimate revelatory, right? Like for most of your life, they're just your parents, right? For most of Harry Potter, Dumbledore is just, you know, the, the wizard, you know, father figure or whatever. Um, or Voldemort is just the bad guy. And then like the revelatory is like finding out that like, oh my God, our parents were like real people with lives and like, I don't know what that has to do with anything. Dan's yeah, not the <laughs> smartest guy in the world, and now my, my I'm, I'm crushed. I hate life now. Well, that's like I think life Snape is did all what? Life is kind of yeah. you know Empire Strikes Back, right? Don't all of us kind of have that experience of you know Darth Vader walking up us up to us and telling him us that he's you know our father, <laughs> you know, finding these facts about your past that you're like, wow, I didn't realize, you know, but that's the revelatory type yeah. stuff. Does Which I think that's uh, so getting back to your initial yeah, the please. story that you're working on. It sounded like there you were so are you pro are you weighing the pros and cons of having no, I've kind of decided what field? to do. I with with my issue, I had a character that was doing stuff that you didn't care about, and then I was gonna flash back like kind of the reason that you cared. And I kind of I kind of ended up realizing that my situation was kind of like finding Nemo, and so I just went back and wrote the beginning, said, I just need to tell the beginning and then we'll get on with the story, you know? Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think I've figured out what to do in that case. But I, I, one other thing I did want to kind of mention though, is, is, um, this kind of idea too, that, that when you do use exposition or backstory, like making that not just exposition, not just like, Hey, here's some stuff we have to tell you, you know, the info just the info dump. And yeah. you're just kind of groaning through it. Like one thing I really love is, is you know, a, a story that can give you that info and make it entertaining at the same time. You know, we talked about uh, the Robert Shaw line. It's, it's, it's a compelling story at the same time it's doing these other things. And I was even thinking about, um, you know, how can we go through out one of these without mentioning Avatar? Um, <laughs> yeah, really. I, one of my favorite uh, kind of backstory exposition moments is – when Aang and Zuko are reading about the history of, of the Avatar, Roku, and Fire Lord Zosin, you know, and it's this great compelling story about these two friends and how they develop and how their friendship kind of disintegrates, but at the same time, it like propels the, the story of, um, of Zuko and, and Aang at the same time. So I think it's great if you can do double duty. It's like, if you're going to tell exposition, tell about the world, do it in a way that's like I'm interested while you're doing it, and do it in a way that's that's gonna compel the story if you can, or propel the story as well if you can. I was gonna say also that it, it comes as a, a pacing thing too, doesn't it? I mean, because like when you talk about the Jaws scene, that was at a moment where let's slow things down a little bit, let's make it quiet, mm-hmm. let's build some dread before we get to the really crazy, awesome action stuff that's gonna happen in a little bit, right? So double duty, I think, is probably a good rule of thumb. You should be getting either something out of the character's motivation, you should be getting something that uh, uh, out of a tone, or what else? What? what were you gonna say, Paul? You looked like you had something to say and maybe not related to what I was just saying. I, I'm I'm just listening rapidly. Oh. Actually, there was something <laughs> kind of bubbling in the back, but I, I'll I'll hold on to it for now. In, well, Jersey, I was I, when Brandon was mentioning Avatar, I couldn't help but think of Legend of Korra, and how there's a huge sort of revelatory flashback backstory to uh, 
a villain character and how that seemed to be actually like one of the more controversial moments uh, in that series as far as people. I mean, the general reaction I got was that people didn't like that scene (laughs) or that people thought it wasn't handled well or wasn't you know, or maybe it was too much information or it was at the wrong time. You know, it's like interesting to try to figure out like, what was it about that scene that seemed to disappoint people so much? Well, I can tell you from my standpoint, what it was is that going back to Brandon's example, here's how they're telling backstory to reveal something about the characters we're already invested in by forming, uh, what, what, what would you call parallels between them? Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas the one in Korra felt like it came out of nowhere. It felt like it. Uh, if, if there was any parallel, if there was any kind of uh, relation to Korra as a character, it was a little bit more obscure, and it was harder for me to find as a viewer. So, yeah, it felt like it was just like, whoa, wait, what, who's this guy? Why should I care? Yeah. You know, whereas with, with uh, the original series, it's like there was a slow build with lots of flashbacks to that comet, and then the slow doling out of information over three seasons so that we really cared by then. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. You also have to be very careful with that parallel. We were talking about, you know, using the parallel to reveal somebody's backstory mm-hmm. or, or using backstory to parallel. It, there's both. You can do both. Where um, I just... I just was rewatching a an episode of Supernatural where, you know, it's about the two brothers doing the road trip, killing monsters. And and they had this one episode where they were there were these two kids and their mom ran the motel where the where the heroes were staying and you know the older brother was looking out for the younger brother and all that stuff, the situation like dredged up things about the Winchester brothers past. You know, and you got to be careful, though, because that kind of stuff, do, dealing with those parallels to bring out backstory or using backstory parallels to reveal character can get really, you know, can get really ham handed where it's like, yeah, I, I, I totally see that you're saying this guy is this guy and this guy is this guy <laughs> and, and sort of like what you're saying. And where did that come from? Yeah. You know, where if you're not careful with it, it even even a, a device to reveal backstory can come across as like, I see you just threw that in there because <laughs> you wanted us to go, oh, yeah. the older brother really loves his younger brother. And you really wanted to put that, you know, make it sure. strong. Yeah. But sometimes, you know, and it's a, I, actually in this case, it kind of worked for me, even though it was melodrama. Mm-hmm. But you, you do have to be really careful because uh, it, uh, that idea of we're trying to forward the story, we're trying to, add tone we're trying to do this but sometimes it can come off as just like okay why don't you just draw a big arrow at this person and go sure you know, sure yeah, yeah. <laughs> love's brother yeah. you know that's what that's what makes writing so hard right? like <laughs> you know it's, it's it's what works for one story doesn't work for another and yeah. you know you guys are talking about lord of the rings and if, you know, if anybody now tried to do what those books do, people would be like, oh, God, you know, stop talking I don't know. about have, bushes. Have, have you guys read The Name of the Wind? The Name of the Wind? I was just going to say, have you guys read The Name of the Wind series? Patrick uh, Rothfuss. No. Yeah, Patrick Rothfuss. That takes it to the nth degree. I just, I, that just came to my mind. It's, that story is, is all about the world, and it takes forever. It's like the most like, long, drawn-out story but at the same time, I absolutely love the story. So um, I don't know. That would be a good one to look as far as backstory because that, that is all about slowly, slowly revealing the, a backstory. And it's all about world building. It's all about exploring this super, super rich, complex world. Um, yeah, and it's, so sometimes, you know, you see that and you're like, oh, God, that's too dense or that's too, I, you know, I – when I first started watching Game of Thrones, I was convinced there was no way I was going to be able to follow that series because there's so many families and so many characters and they're jumping back and forth. I mean, the, sh- the show opens with a map of this world and hopping back and forth from place to place. <laughs> a as mechanical if map. That yeah. 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 Well, like, of course, Rivendell is next to this town. Next to that. Of yeah. course, that makes total sense to me. Um, Somehow they managed to make that work, and, and I don't know how I'm, I was able to make it through the two seasons, and I'm now actually intrigued and want to read the books. I, I, um, I wonder that's how an much an example it, of, you know, oh. they obviously he did so much, uh, George R. Martin did so much front-loaded backstory, and, and, 
but it throws you right into the story. Like he, you know, that, that book, or at least the show opens up and you're just sort of like in the middle of all these characters and what is obviously years of drama and you have to put it all together. And it does not like talk down to the audience. That, like they make you like, you have to keep up or you're, or you're, or you're lost on that. Uh, I've never watched, uh, interactive special features on a dvd before game of thrones as far as like you know like not the 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 documentaries but like the actual like you know press forward to read about this family and read about this historic crest or whatever wow (laughs) yeah press this to bring up name badges on each character to remind (laughs) you who they are you know i heard george R. r martin talk about game of thrones and and he made a comment that i wonder might reveal like how he kind of makes it work is that he, even though it's a super complex story, he starts with everyone that you're going to follow basically in the same location. So the very beginning of the story, you kind of are introduced to everyone with probably the exception of Daenerys. And then they all kind of spread out and do their own thing. But you kind of understand how they're connected. You at least start in kind of a more simple way. Because the Starks and the Baratheons are all right there. Yeah, Yeah. kind of doing their... Feast together. I, by the way, George R. R. Martin, gamer, ah, RPG. I wasn't slagging gaming. Yeah. I was not. I like, like, no, but I just find him a geek too. Yeah, yeah, but uh, but yeah, he very much, very I, much into the. Uh, I want to get into the show. I wanted to, but uh, the first three, I think, two minutes with all the disemboweled bodies and then the scary <laughs> girl with the scary eyes, and I was like, ah, I had to shut it off. I couldn't take it. It's <laughs> too intense. Jersey just <laughs> didn't have a large enough supply of Depends to keep it. I, I'm too sensitive to that stuff, man. It was too scary. So, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I pro- I'm sure it's a really well-written show, but, uh, yeah. Ooh. See, and most of the time I spend going, ah. Could we have another disemboweling, please? <laughs> Followed by a half nude makeout scene, please. Can we? Actually, if they could just make out. On top <laughs> oh God! Of the... Stop! Stop! Yeah. No, that's done. Okay. Well, we got to get the book recommendations because Sharon Iverson is patiently waiting in the control room to come in here to talk with us. So, uh, <laughs> you guys, I didn't. I did. I, you know, wow, uh, we, that did fly. It did fly. <laughs> I told you, uh, uh, Brandon and Dave. I did not ask you guys if you had any book recommendations before we did the recording. And Dave, I mean, I blindsided you with a text this morning. Morning. So, uh, if you guys wanted to do some book recommendations, you're fi- uh, you're welcome to. But uh, we'll start with Paul, and then he's going to do musical chairs with Sharon, okay. and she's going to come in and share some of her uh, book talks. What do you got? I what actually, is this? I I I believe I've mentioned the Dreamer before. Let's see if I'm getting this in the. in the actual uh, thing she's wearing, you know, full full dress. That's no problem. Go ahead. So, um, in in the in the past she's, you know, fully clothed uh, in in the appropriate things. But uh, oh, I missed something I, sh- I I think while I was out. I'm just hearing all this stuff about being fully clothed. <laughs> <laughs> and, we had, and we're not talking about Game of Thrones. <laughs> we had a slight audio snafu for a second yeah, there. And, yeah, and Jersey was Jersey was complaining about this uh, provocative cover. I wasn't complaining. <laughs> I was just saying that I was it was confused he, he because was, I see this cover of this book called The Dream with a Girl with a Three Cornered Hat and then Exposed Midriff, and I was like, that doesn't look like Revolutionary War to me. And it, <laughs> and it isn't. It's a kind of a symbolic cover. Ah. See, um, but it is. It's great. Laura is a historian. Okay. As well as a artist, and uh, she does a great job of weaving in the um, the history uh, in with a, a pretty compelling story. And you know, th- B has this whole like I'm dreaming this thing, and it seems more real to me in some respects than my life. Um, I, I, it's it's well worth uh, checking out. Uh, you can check it out on thedreamer.com. dot com. The Paul, dreamer. if you like her stuff so much, why don't the you dream her podcast? <laughs> I sh- she's never invited me. That's oh, why. Okay. Wait, wait, she has a podcast too. We should give a plug to that. She does. Uh, if I could only remember the name well, of the podcast, I guess I can go to Paper Wings. It's it paper is Paper Wings. Wings. Oh, Paper Wings with Chris Oatley. That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Lauren is in Chris Oatley. Uh, PaperWingsShow.com, yeah. If I'm not and mistaken. And I realized actually, it's thedreamercomic.com. Yeah. The Dreamer My wife really likes the book, too. Don't That's go to thedreamer.com. Oh. Dreamercomic.com. I'm going to go to thedreamer.com and then teenboat.com right after that. So. <laughs> <No>. uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. 
<laughs> and I and I actually I, and I want to just do a quick plug. As Paperwingspodcast.com dot com is her podcast. So there we go. Okay. So. And oh, yes, and, and I, I was going wanna... to ask you, I was going to say, Paul, you make comics. I do make comics. You are not a sophist. I am not. Well, <laughs> I'm not just a sophist. Um, <laughs> but I'm very excited because we just, the very first comic I ever wrote, uh, Robin of Sherwood, with uh-huh. a Y, it's about Robin Hood's daughter. Um, uh, Robin Hood is dead. Uh, Prince John has become king, widely regarded as one of the worst kings England ever has. Um, and uh, Robin and Marianne's daughter has to take up the fight with a band of merry men, new and old. Um, and uh, this is the very first book I ever did. Uh, we've uh, done a, what I call a remastered edition. It's been redrawn uh, from some places from the original uh, layouts and, and touched up and re-lettered. And um, it's just, it's, I, I think that, that uh, Rob Davis uh, working from Michael Larson's layouts for Partly and... and uh, doing that looks very stuff. pretty. Yeah, it came out really, really gorgeous. Um, and that is available through IndiePlanet.com. IndiePlanet.com. Both, both digitally or print on demand. So, yes, we will put a link to that in the show notes. And this is not the book that you did that's based on the Kevin Costner film, right? Uh, that's because I never did one based <laughs> on the Kevin Costner film. Or, and, and I actually, now that never you mentioned late. Prince of Thieves... <laughs> Yeah. I feel like I have to mention that Robin of Sherwood came out a couple of years before Disney did a horrible TV movie with Keira Knightley called Princess of Thieves about <laughs> Gwen, the daughter of Robin Hood. Yeah. Um, the, the, I, I believe people will enjoy this considerably more. <laughs> well, I, and, I, and I bet your, your Robin uh, emotes better than Costner or Knightley. Oh no! Don't <laughs> don't take shots at Kira. <laughs> oh, she's all right. And actually, Costner's okay as long as he's not doing. I will not rest until my father's name has been I, I, avenged. Exactly. This I swear <laughs> with these drops of my own blood. That's what he's I'm saying, great. though. As long as he's not doing. I mean, great in Bull Durham. <laughs> but yeah, you know, actually, you put a, a Desperado. He was awesome. But Desperado. Was it Desperado? Not didn't Desperado. Like Silverado. 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 I loved him in Silverado. I did I, not like Prince of Thieves. <laughs> I did not like it on the house. I did not like it with a mouse. I did. I. I the Sheriff of Nottingham was great. In Prince of Thieves. He, was he in stole a the movie. He was in a different movie. <laughs> Alan Rickman was in a different movie. But Guys, anyway, Christian Slater was in that. <laughs> yes, right. he's hot, dude. <laughs> we had the same father. <laughs> yeah. But I hate you, dude. <laughs> <All right. laughs> um, this is shooting fish in a barrel. We guys. really need to let Sharon get in here. We need to let Sharon get in here. So. But Robin of Sherwood, people should go to indieplanet.com and find it today. It will be linked in the show notes at comics are And you can actually go to Robin of Sherwood.com. Robin oh, Sherwood. you can just Dot do com. that if you're just and listening the, in your car. There, there are links there. Pull over and uh, read it on your iPad. There you go. So, well, you can go to robinsherwood.com for links. Oh, I do uh, not have a. I do not have it serialized on the web as yet. No, no, I'm saying to get the PDF. Yes. to read on your digital device. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There you go. So, you Paul go. Story, thank you so much for coming. It was back. really great to be back, guys. Thanks. So good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you, Paul. Thanks, <laughs> thanks for all the wonderful uh, food for thought on uh, storytelling. And so and backstory and, and you back. don't have to have me back. Yeah, I would love to have story back for some more backstory. Right. There we go. We got we fit it in. Oh, there we go. <laughs> All, right. All right, thanks, Paul. So we're gonna do the switcheroo. Get Sharon in here, and I will turn to Brandon Dayton. Did you have anything that you wanted to do a shout out for today? Yeah, uh, I've got two recommendations. One is one that Jersey recommended I read uh, last week, The Three oh. Shadows. Oh, my so gosh. It's one that's been out for a while, but just a fantastic piece of art. Um, Cyril Pedrosa. So art's great. Storytelling's great. There's some things about backstory in there, too, that are that are interesting. But um, I really like that. The other one I, I just picked up was uh, Hilda and the Night Giant, I believe. Hilda oh, the, yeah. The Night Giant, yeah, that's guess, a good one. Yeah. Which is, I guess was a big hit at uh, SPX, but um, – the printing on it is just beautiful. Like that's like holding it in my hands. I like didn't want to like my hands to ruin the book. So it's kind of a fun one to pick up just to kind of, I guess, no brow press uh, printed it and they're known for having really cool, well thought out printed stuff. And it's you just put that on the iPad. Though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's the one that's a good argument for why books should stay books and not, not go digital. It's just a really beautifully printed book. <laughs> You mean in addition to digital? In addition, sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, but Hilda and the Night Giant is, is a book that works better as a book than digital. There's no question. I mean, the, the printing on that thing is, uh, and it's printed really large too. Which Big uh, format? Yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, no. There there are there are some out there that work better in paper form. So, 
Uh, those are both good picks, Brandon. Dave, did you have anything? Um, I just wanted to give another shout out to a book that you guys mentioned last week uh, with Gina on the episode Broxo by uh, Zach Giolongo. Definitely sort of about pretty much everything we were talking about. Um, it's sort of a barbarian story, but um, it's about a girl who's searching this mountain for this uh, clan that seems to have been wiped out. So it's sort of like a mystery story of finding like, you know, what happened to these people. Um, so lots of world building, but, but stuff that, you know, there's obviously a lot more world building than you actually see in the book. Um, but it's sort of a great, uh, fantasy story that goes down pretty easy. Um, it has a lot of great action and the, I think the storytelling, the visual storytelling is definitely the strongest thing about the book. Um, it's just beautiful to sort of like see, you know, the, the panel to panel moments, uh, uh, are just great. It's really uh, worth checking out. So Broxo from First Second Books. Uh, I'll see if I get Zach to come on the show to talk about his books. Oh, I'm sure he would. Yeah, because uh, I've heard nothing but good things, and I will read it. I'm sure it's already in the library's collection or will be soon. It'll be uh, add to the collection shortly. So with that, I have to turn to Sharon Iverson. Oh, my gosh, Sharon. So we had Paul's story back after all these all these yeah. months. And we get Sharon Iverson back after all this time. So uh, good It see has you. been a while. It has. It has. <clears throat> been, you busy lady. So. Yeah, no, you're the busy guy. Well, but but you're the busy lady who's putting out all these <laughs> comics programs at the Ann Arbor District Library. Yes. We had that great one with Tony Cliff. Yeah. Uh, what was it? Two weeks ago, yep. something like that. And, yep. and that reminds me. Before I forget, Tony Cliff actually sent me a link uh, in regards to today's episode, and it was to a Wikipedia article, which I'll put in the chat. Uh, the Art of Dramatic Writing by. L- L- Lajos Igri? Oh, no. I hate being that guy who <laughs> mispronounces names. But uh, have you guys heard of this? Originally uh-uh. pr- published by Simon & Schuster in 1942, How to Write a Play. Igri's treatise was revised and published as The Art of Dramatic Writing in 1946. I will put a link in the show notes for that, and it's posting into the chat now. So there's another resource to follow up on in regards to this whole backstory stuff. So, okay, Sharon, what yeah. do you got? What do I have? What oh. do you got? I, I had to do some homework while I was on the public information desk today. <laughs> I kind of I kind of emailed you this morning and said, "Oh, this is what we're talking about today. You might want to get some books that actually refer to this topic." So yeah, and I'm glad Brandon mentioned Hilda and the Midnight Giant because I think one episode back or two, I was paging. I just love that book too. So yeah, it's awesome. a great one. Um, so I had these books and I thought, okay, what's the backstory here? Um, I don't know if this is showing up. Binky and the Space Cat. Binky the Space Cat. We've talked about this one on uh, the Kids Comics Revolution, right, Dave? Yeah. yeah. And so it's Bink- a series too. Yep, it's a series. I'm just going to mention in the in the first book, it Binky gets his little package in the mail. He's going to be an official space cat, and that means he can fight aliens. And what you don't know until you go back to when Binky was just a little kit- kitten. Um, the whole story of how you know he noticed all these buzzy things flying around and that he d- defined those as the aliens and therefore he was on a mission to take care of ridding the world as we know it of all flying objects which when he tried and failed miserably to fly himself then he decided eh, you know, <laughs> we'll just do away with all the rest so that's one um, fun book uh, City of Spies was kind of interesting. This one we talked about before, but it can't get recommended enough. No, Dave, you yeah. recommended this one before, right? Yeah. yeah, I love that book. Yeah, and I, I've talked about it too. But, you know, I was kind of just thinking of the backstory thing, the fact that Ella is doing comics, and the comics that are presented, you know, kind of are the old-style dot, you know, dotted format. Um, so that Yeah, when the, the, the Ben Day dots is yeah. what they call them. Ben Day. Ben Day, which is referring to a guy, isn't it, Brandon? Uh, ben Day, who came up with that mechanical toning process, I think. No? I just know the name. That's it. Ben like cool. the Lichtenstein style dots. Yeah, yeah. Not to be confused with Ben Gay. No. 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 <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't um, do with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I mean, it, it, it's part of, you know, it's kind of a side story bit. I mean, it's part of the story, but at the same time, it's revealing more about, you know, contrasting her real life, her lonely life, with the character that she would like to be, you know, more robust, more of a heroine kind of thing. So that's kind of cool. I guess you call that a side story? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
whatever. <laughs> I, lis- I listened to your discussion, and it's like, yeah, what the heck is a backstory anyway? <laughs> and then there's Anne Frank, the, the um, biography that was done by Sid Jacobson and Ernie Cologne, mm. and mm. Yeah. The, the little snapshot bits because the, the time period and the, the breadth of the history and the action that's going on those little snapshots give you, you know, little snippets of the history as the story's going along. So, kind plus, of uh, and I made no secret of my admiration for Ernie Cologne. That guy yeah. is amazing. I'll read anything that that guy draws hungrily. So, yeah. And my last one is um, Ernest and Rebecca. My best friend is a germ by <laughs> Guillaume Bianco, and it's about a lo- another lonely little girl whose uh, parents are. Maybe going to be divorced. You don't know. I think this is a multi-volume series too, and it's when, what's interesting is that she's telling you the story about how she catches this germ, or it catches her. But it anyway, um, and you know, so she it's it's a first-person depiction. But every so often, as in the the six panels here, it goes to a cartoony, like she's literally drawing this is the her little mind's side. Eye, yeah sidebar and so she's reflecting back on a an event that where they drove somewhere last Sunday but it's all this little mini cartoony and then it goes forward again and then, yeah that's, so see, that's this is this is one of the things that comics does really well is that we can very easily and visually show you that this is a flashback this yep. is inside the kid's mind, right? Mm-hmm. Just by changing the art style or changing the panel board and stuff. A little harder to do that in film. Uh, animation can do it obviously since it's using cartoons but sure. But yeah, that's awesome. That, and that, this has a really lovely animated look to it. Have you guys heard of this, Brandon or Dave? Um, I mean, yeah. talk about uh, an interesting yeah. storyline. <laughs> Ernest, <laughs> Ernest, Ernest and Rebecca. is the germ. It's from from Paper Cuts. I had not heard of this before. This looks really pretty. Yeah, it was, I think it's brought over from Europe. Ah, but I'm well, not sure. They have all the good comics over there. I know. All right, yeah. I've got one. Okay. Uh, this one is is I brought it to loan it to you, Ooh. and this is. Uh, the original 1998 edition of Quick and Forbidden by Dave Roman. And I, Dave, I didn't. Ah. I honestly didn't Whoa. know you were going to be here today. I honestly goodness <laughs> did not know you were going to be here today. Uh, but I brought it because I knew Sharon would want to read it. This yeah. was uh, the self-published edition by uh, Dave and John Green back in the 90s. Wow. So this is deep cuts, old school, <laughs> Jack's Epoch, Quick and Forbidden. And it's really good. I mean, I wasn't doing stuff that good in 1998, so it kind of broke my heart in a way. <laughs> Neat. But Sorry. yeah. So uh, I found it at the Dawn Treader of all places. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was just walking around downtown. I was cool. like, oh, I'll stop in the Dawn Treader to see what they got. And I walked by their comic section, and there was the spine. I was like, Duh! so I grabbed oh, it. It looks so nice. It's in still in good shape. Yeah. I don't think anybody ever read it, did they, Dave? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's 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 got some love showing on it. It's yes. a little dinged up in places, but but yeah, I, I don't know if this is still around anywhere. If anybody can find it, if you look on not eBay. that version of it. You can still get the the um, the what I consider the the, the officially printed version uh, from AIT Planet Lar. Oh. oh, yeah, I think it's still available through Amazon and or you know certainly on used bookstore sites and stuff. But no, I think it's still technically in print. Oh, uh, from AIT Planet Lar. Yeah, but there's two volumes uh, of. Now, is that one called Quick and Forbidden, or is it? It's just called Quick and Forbidden. Oh, it's cover. just called Quick and Forbidden. Yeah, that's that's why it's old school. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so the the newer version is called Jack's Epoch and the Quick and Forbidden. Oh, you can okay. just call it Jack's Epoch. I'm fine with just that. <laughs> <laughs> But this cool. w- this one also has pinups by Klaus Jansen and uh, you know f- uh, an afterword by Klaus Jansen and th- there's a lot of great pinups in here actually. It's got Morris do that. Oh no, is that who did the or did Mark Crilly do? I forget. Somebody did something in that too. There's a whole mess of uh, really great. I, I miss pinups, man. <laughs> uh, there's there's a Dave Roman pinup, a John Green pinup, and then we've got wow a bunch of John Green ones. C. S. Morse. And yeah, Scott Morse back when he was C.S. Morse. Oh yeah, so I can hold that up so people can see. So yeah, yeah. and actually the the revised version, like the full printed one, has like more pinups and like full color pinups in the back too. Oh, fancy! There's the Klaus Jansen one. Oh man, it looks sweet. So this is the Jax Epoch story, right? Yeah, it is. So I've, the, I've car- the main it. character's name is Jax, and when we originally named the series Quick and Forbidden, it was like one of those things that we quickly regretted. 
Uh, Quickly. <laughs> we, this started. is a discussion for another time when we talk about titling books, right? Yeah, that's definitely. Uh... <laughs> but it, it was it was of its time because it felt like a lot of the other stuff that was being produced in the '90s in terms of title and and tone, right? Uh, Quick and Forbidden sounds like the kind of mysterious, like, oh, what's this new world that I have to get invested in, right? The kind of title. See, that's great that you thought that because that's exactly what we thought it was. <laughs> but immediately people were like, so what does this have to do with the accounting software exactly? Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> and we were like. And then the irony is, is then I get a job at Staples where I like work right in front of like a whole shelf of Quicken software. <laughs> and it just, and I'm just you like, down. Oh, you're haunting me. You're haunting me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, oh, it's a good book either way if you got the original old school edition or mm -hmm. if you got the new. And that's in the library's collection, yes. too. You've, yes. used, you've done a book talk on that yep. one before. Yep. So, uh, OK, well, any closing thoughts on this whole backstory stuff, guys? I'm, I Now that Paul's not there. Oh, Paul is. No, Paul's got a mic now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's create Paul's backstory right now. Uh, yeah. So uh, I wanted to give everybody a chance for any final thoughts, words on this before we close the show. Sharon, did you have any promotion things that you wanted to? Oh, well, we want to talk about um, what's coming up in November, November 4, Sunday, 1 to 3, right here at the Downtown Library from in the fourth floor meeting room. We have Michelangelo Cicerone that's going to talk about the whole world and fun of comics jams. Comics, comics jams. Jamming. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, and we're going to do a comics jam. And we're going to do it. So there's... There's another chance for backstories. So. Collaborative story writing, yeah. right? Uh, yep. So that 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 that's in the is that on the fourth floor? Yep. It's fourth, fourth floor, floor conference meeting. room mm -hmm. or meeting room mm -hmm. at the Ann Arbor District Library downtown mm -hmm. branch. Uh, Sunday, November four. November fourth, one to three p.m. One to three. Yeah, comics.adl.org if you want to look it up, folks. Anybody yep. in the local area? Anything else? Uh, December we've got another one, but yes, is that, that's Casey, not Casey Van Heis. Casey Van Heis of WintersandLavelle.com is going to be our guest. Manga speaker. storytelling. And we're going to talk about the mangas. Mm -hmm. So, uh, okay. No final thoughts on uh, backstory? We're good? We feel like we walked around that one a little bit? I feel like we got nowhere close to, to, to <laughs> defining this at that's, all. You know, that's the thing. That's, that's what we're supposed to do. We're just supposed to get, get, do a quick little walk around the idea, see what it's shaped like, feel its different parts from our various vantage points, and then go, well, it's kind of like that. And now we'll put it to the listeners. They can email us. I was going to say, get viewer feedback, yeah. and then we can maybe do a follow-up. Yeah, we could always do a part two to this one. And if you have any uh, Maybe front story. Yeah, we'll do front story. <laughs> or side. It's going to be all about my book, which is my quick and forbidden that was named uh, poorly, and nobody knows what the heck it's about. The what, front. The front. What's it about? Uh, hey, read the book. Hot front, cold front. We don't know. Yeah, I don't even know. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So, well, well, you can email us at comicsaregreat at gmail.com, and I will forward it on to all parties involved, and we can always uh, resume for a part two to this one if you guys are interested. And uh, with that, I will say, Paul, thank you. Paul Story of Storyville.com. Thank you for being part of this. This one, anything you already promoted, Robin. So I did. okay, you're done. Uh, Brandon Dayton, <laughs> <laughs> Brandon Dayton, BrandonDayton.com. What do you got that's coming up? You've been working hard on, you know, just just my website. I mean, I'm just constantly posting stuff there right now. So you know, nothing else big to to promote right now. But you you've got you've got the blog and you've got uh, the Twitter presence, Brandon Dayton on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Okay. So people can always message you that way if they want to. Uh, Absolutely. Want clarification yeah. of your points made. <laughs> All right. When 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 the new book is done, we'll have you back to talk about that too. Sure. And then, last but not least, uh, Dave Roman of of yaytime.com. Thanks for again for you know rolling out of bed to be a part of this one. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> the, the glamorous life of the artist. Going, going back to bed as soon as this is over, Dave? Yeah, probably. <laughs> Take a nap after this one. <laughs> yes, that time. Uh, so what, what do you got? What do you got that you want to point people at? Um, I've got Teen Boat is still available. I've got Astronaut Academy 2 coming out in May of next year. Um, but I think stores will probably be able to start pre-ordering it in a month or so. I don't know how that works. Um, and I think I have another book. I did a... I contributed to an anthology called Dear Teen Me uh, that oh. comes out like next week or something like that. And is that what the title suggests? It's like letters to yourself? It's when you letters were... to your teenage self. Um, and mine is a comic um, where like a lot of the book is, is prose, but there's a couple of comics in there. I cool. think uh, Faith Aaron Hicks did one. And um, uh, Tom Engelberger, who is the author of 
uh, the strange case of origami Yoda, which is an extremely, extremely popular and funny series of, uh, middle grade books. Oh, uh, cool. It, yeah. So that's, uh, letters to teenage me. Um, it's called dear teen me, dear teen me. Okay. So we'll see. Uh, yeah. Okay. So we'll it put is that... probably the most embarrassing comic I've ever done. So. <laughs> oh no! I got to read it. Get out. Yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's totally like memoir, autobio, like stuff that I probably should not have written about that now I regret and it's too late. <laughs> oh, oh man! We all want to read. I that, know. Dave. He just he just sold some books. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> what a way to hook everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah really. Uh, okay. Well. Cool. Well. And then Sharon Iverson of Comics.adl.org. Mm-hmm. Thank you for being here. Sure. With a great book recommendations. Always good to see you. And uh, until next time, everybody. This show will be archived at comicsagreat.com slash cag66. And, uh, again, you can find it on – we stream live every other Wednesday at comicsagreat.tv and at youtube.com slash comicsagreat. Thank you once again to Matt Dubay of, of the Ann Arbor District Library for being the technical director on the show and always accepting the challenge of putting on a difficult show. Oh, it's always fun. <laughs> and check out uh, AADL.org for more of these uh, the various podcasts that they produce out of here. Until next time, everybody, I have been Jersey Drozd of comicsagreat.com and Jersey on the Twitters. Okay, bye.